Hey everyone, welcome back to the Solar Punk Farmer. It has been quite a while. I have been busy at work doing some very exciting research and development here in the Resilience Garden. The Solar Punk Farmer Resilience Garden project is both a living laboratory and a demonstration site for low cost, home scale, regenerative agriculture. My goal here is to show that you have the power to fight climate change and food desertification right in your own neighborhood. Here, we are applying a few simple techniques to heal degraded land, sequester carbon into the soil, increase biodiversity, and grow delicious, healthy, nutritious food to feed our community. In this video, we will cover one method that I have been exploring in pursuit of these ends, sheet composting. This is a technique that you can apply without spending a single penny on fertilizers, soil amendments, or other garden products. Let's jump right in, and I will show you how I applied sheet composting with locally available materials that I acquired for free. To recap, last season I went ahead and tried growing some vegetables in my heavily compacted and barren native soil that had been freshly amended with free city compost of questionable quality. Evidently, this was not enough, and my plants only really got going after I began to add the biofertilizer teas I talked about in my garden tour video. I have done quite a bit of research and experimentation since then, and now I have a pretty good idea of where I should take things from here. You can find a list of free resources that I have been consulting that I have found to be particularly useful in the description of this video. At its core, Regenerative agriculture seeks to mimic successional processes that nature has spent billions of years perfecting. As in a regenerating forest or prairie, this means that you need two things, a supply of dead plant material to build humus and living roots to activate the soil food web. Once you introduce some good biology, which may very well come over with the materials you are using, nature will take over and do the work for you. As such, the approach I will be employing henceforth involves two main techniques. First, I will be using sheet composting to add bulk organic matter to the soil. Second, I will utilize cover crops to stimulate the soil food web and begin improving the composition and structure of the soil throughout the soil profile. One of the goals of the Resilience Garden Project is to find ways to make regenerative agriculture accessible to individuals who are suffering suffering from chronic underemployment and financial stress, two issues that have been affecting a lot of people as of late due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Sheet composting is an excellent method for those of you who are struggling financially, whether due to current events or otherwise, but still want to find a good way to grow food in whatever space you have available. In a nutshell, sheet composting involves applying alternating layers of green and brown material to build a sheet mulch on top of your soil up to a foot high in total. These materials will begin to compost down in a manner similar to a traditional cold compost pile, and will begin to slowly integrate themselves into whatever soil you started with. Over time, you will end up building fertile and biologically active topsoil right on the spot. Sometimes a completed sheet compost will be topped up with compost or a commercial soil mixture. This allows the bed of sheet compost to be planted out immediately, and you can definitely take this approach. In my case, I did not have access to high volumes of free quality compost or soil mixture at the time. And of course, in the spirit of the Resilience Garden project, buying soil or compost is to be kept to an absolute minimum, so I opted out of it. Building a healthy soil that can support plants takes time especially if you are not topping your sheet compost up with a compost or commercial garden soil mix that is ready for immediate planting. Of course, the soil building process may be a bit slower to progress if you are starting off with barren, rock hard dirt like me. Since you may have to allow your beds to lie fallow for a couple months using this method, I would recommend starting the sheet compost at a time of year where growing conditions are not optimal and dead plant material is readily available, such as in the fall or winter. I would also recommend top dressing or amending the underlying soil with a couple inches of high quality compost, as this will speed up the soil building process if you are starting from scratch. However, this is not necessary if you are willing to wait a bit longer. Apologies on me not having footage of laying down the materials. Due to my schedule, I had to complete most of my work under the cover of darkness, which made getting footage unfeasible. However, I can still give you a detailed overview of the materials I used how I applied them, and what the soil underneath them looks like now, two and a half months later. All right, let's have a discussion about layers. Any good sheet compost will have layers. I would recommend putting the more easy to decompose materials on the bottom if you are going to be using the top layer as a mulch, or vice versa, if you plan to top dress with compost or garden soil and then plant directly into the bed immediately. Layer one was about an inch of chop and drop materials, which are considered greens. The chop and drop method is commonly employed in permaculture systems. For annual gardens, it involves cutting your vegetables at ground level at the end of the season and mulching with all of the above ground materials. This enables both the crop residues and the dead plant roots that have been left in 
the soil to compost right in your beds, which adds organic matter to the soil surface and creates corridors of organic material beneath the surface as the roots of your crops decompose. This has the effect of both building a humus layer on top of your beds and improving the quality and structure of the soil beneath the surface. Everything that I grew in the beds during the warm season was incorporated into the chop and drop. This included all of my moringa trees in the area, which I just cut at soil level. I fully expect them to grow back from the roots through my cover crops this year. I ended up removing the oyas as well, and overall consider that experiment to have yielded promising results. In addition to all the crop residues from the soil beds, I incorporated crop residues from my aquaponics system and residues that I acquired at a local organic urban farm. Layer two was a light sprinkling of homemade compost. I added this layer purely to introduce biology. I only ended up using just over one five gallon bucket of compost per bed. As I have learned, good compost is an inoculant for your soil more than anything else. So if you have really high quality compost, a little bit goes a long way. I ended up sifting my compost using a quarter inch sieve prior to applying it to the beds. This was necessary since I operate a continuous pile that receives food scraps from the kitchen around once or twice per week. I didn't want any bits of kitchen waste that had not fully broken down making their way into my beds. Layer three was roughly two inches of leaves that I had collected from around the yard. These are considered browns. Being that there are plenty of deciduous trees in the area, mainly American sycamore, sweet gum, and Fremont's cottonwood, fallen leaves were readily available in the fall when I began the sheet compost. I chose to use fallen leaves as my browns for this layer because they will decompose more quickly than tougher brown materials that are higher in lignin such as wood chips. Since this layer completed the bottom portion of my sheet compost, I wanted to ensure that it would become incorporated into the underlying topsoil fairly quickly. This meant that I didn't have to wait as long to plant into the sheet compost. Layer four was about two inches of leaves and chipped branches that I'd collected from a Tipuana tipu tree that resides at a local organic farm. Tipuana tipu, also known as rosewood, is a large and fast growing nitrogen fixing tree that is commonly employed as a canopy species in agroforestry systems. Tipu trees are not only extremely common around the Los Angeles area, they produce abundant amounts of nitrogen-rich foliage, which makes an excellent green material. The foliage is also a breeze to break down, as the wood is fairly light and the leaves pretty much just snap right off of the branches. I was able to process all of the leaves that I needed for my beds by hand in about two hours. I ran the branches through my wood chipper and incorporated the wood chips that I had produced into this layer as well. The foliage of nitrogen fixing trees makes a fantastic material for mulch or composting in general. I would highly recommend that you check out to see which species of nitrogen fixing trees are common in your area. Layer five, the final layer, was a layer of wood chips about two to three inches thick. Some of these I acquired locally for free from a reputable source, and others I made myself by cutting dead branches from around the area and running them through my small electric wood chipper. It's convenient to have a wood chipper such as this so that you can make your own wood chips, but wood chips acquired for free from local tree trimming companies will work just fine, provided there's not a lot of trash in them. This final layer serves three functions. First of all, wood chips are an excellent fungal food. They will support the growth of even more beneficial saprophytic fungi while breaking down over the course of a couple years into a rich humic material. Secondly, wood chips will act as a long-lived protective layer that will retain moisture, moderate soil temperatures, and shield the beneficial biology under the soil from the sun's harsh rays. And last but not least, thirdly, a thick mulch of wood chips will prevent weeds from growing and stop them right in their tracks. If there is one thing that I have learned from my extensive research, it is to never leave soil exposed. Wood chips are one of the best protective mulches you could possibly apply to your soil. In addition to all of these materials, I applied some worm castings and some red composting worms that I harvested from my worm farm. My worms have been really quick to reproduce in the sheet compost and have been accelerating the decomposition process. I have come to understand a worm farm as one of the greatest assets a gardener can have. Not only is vermicomposting an easy, space-efficient, odor-free method for converting food scraps and other organic waste materials into an ultra-high quality compost, a worm farm itself acts as a habitat for key members of the soil food web that you can use to inoculate your soil at any time, whether through the application of worm castings themselves or compost teas brewed from the worm castings. I have been collecting some leaf litter and chunks of wood from around the area that have visible mycelium strands growing on them and added them to my worm farm in the hopes that I can further increase the biodiversity of beneficial organisms in there. The worms themselves will consume the spores of beneficial bacteria and fungi that are on the decaying organic matter and excrete them back out the other end, along with a plethora of beneficial bacteria that they store naturally in their guts to help them digest the organic matter. So whenever I add the worms to my soil, the worms will effectively inoculate it for me. 
In addition, my worm farm hosts a collection of beneficial insects, arthropods, and small organisms that are introduced to my soil whenever I apply worm castings. That being said, you don't need to have a worm farm or worm castings for this to work. Your local earthworms will eventually end up finding their way into your sheet compost on their own, and will bring plenty of wonderful biology with them. Otherwise, over the course of the past two and a half months, I have kept the beds moist and watched the sheet composting process progress pretty much exactly as I intended. Colonies of saprophytic fungi have taken over much of the sheet composting materials, as you can see here. Their growth has been absolutely explosive over the past two months. Additionally, I pick up an earthworm almost every time I dig through the beds, and overall, the beds are teeming with all sorts of invertebrates and other small organisms. And now, for the grand reveal. Here is what the soil underneath the sheet compost looks like now. The results have been nothing short of stunning. The soil is now well structured, rich in organic matter, and full of life. It looks and smells much better now even than it did before I applied the sheet compost. Not to mention it has the most amazing sweet earthy smell of healthy living soil. By far the strongest smelling soil I have ever encountered. The rich odor is evidence of high levels of actinomycetes and other beneficial organisms that are responsible for the decomposition of organic matter. Compare that to completely untreated soil nearby which as you can see, is once again rock hard and mostly devoid of plant life. However, I have had a couple issues with some of the materials. The chunks of banana stem have taken quite a while to break down, and unlike the rest of the chop and drop materials, are not yet fully decomposed. This means that I have ended up with large pieces of partially decayed banana stem at the bottom of the sheet compost. The tipu leaves have also not been breaking down as quickly as I would have hoped, but their decomposition is still moving along. It turns out that some varieties of saprophytic fungi really love them, which is a huge plus. These materials and any other tough foliage that you find in your area would be quicker to decompose if they are shredded into very small pieces. Anyways, I decided to peel aside the wood chips in two of my beds and plant some potatoes, peas, fava beans, beets, nasturtium, a royal lupine, daikon radish, spinach, and garlic. As you can see, some of these are coming up quite nicely, while others are struggling a bit. Granted, their growth has been slow due to a lack of sun exposure in this location at this time of year. I have been staggering the planting of the beds a few weeks apart so that the plants in the more shaded areas have better access to sunlight as they grow up. I'm not expecting a very large crop from these plants, and I mainly just want to begin stimulating the mutualistic bacteria and fungi in my soil in preparation for the aggressive, semi-edible cover cropping regime I am planning to sow this spring. I will be doing a video documenting that as well, so stay tuned. To sum things up, I have found that sheet composting is an excellent way to build healthy, living soil on a budget. This method of regenerative agriculture is very easy, requires minimal labor, and can yield spectacular results in just a few months. Furthermore, all of the materials required for this you can likely find around you for free. All you need is decent amounts of green and brown materials, such as crop residues, leaf litter, grass clippings, compostable food scraps, or wood chips. You can use pretty much any kind of organic material that is safe for a food garden. The true beauty of regenerative agriculture is that you can easily turn what people normally consider waste into some of the best soil you have ever seen in a way that works with the natural process of soil formation instead of against it or in spite of it. You can do this on pretty much any land that you have access to, even if the soil is completely devoid of life. If many of us begin to work with nature to build soil, we could truly make an impact in terms of being better stewards of the earth, reducing our dependence on the destructive industrial food system, and repairing the soil beneath our feet so that we can once again share it with many of the beautiful and unique life forms that inhabit this planet. Through regenerative agriculture, even ordinary people like me and you could become a truly beneficial part of all of the ecosystems we depend on. And that is truly solar punk. I hope you all found this video helpful and useful, especially those of you who are struggling financially right now and have to garden on a budget. That concludes this episode of The Solar Punk Farmer. Stay tuned for more, happy new years, and catch you on the flip side.